we're seeing some more people join us for this session. So um, get started and go over some keeping items for the session. So my name is Caitlin Chen. I am the Digital Marketing Manager at Wildlife Conservation Network. And today I'm super excited to get to moderate our Q&A session with Olya Esipova from Saga Conservation Alliance. So this is your chance to get to know more about Olya, more about her work and what Saga Conservation Alliance does. Um, so there's a few ways that you can participate in today's session. You'll be able to participate directly with us live on camera by clicking the request permission button in the top right of your video panel. And I see many people are already doing that. So when you do that, you'll be entered into a queue. And when we're ready to start asking questions, I'll go ahead and accept you on screen. And we'll have about three to people, um, three to four people on screen with us at one time. If you don't want to join us live on camera, that's completely fine too. We have a chat box on the right. You can go ahead and submit your questions there. Uh, my colleague David Vasquez is also on the chat moderating that. Um, and we'll go through those questions and I'll ask um, for you. It's likely we won't be able to get to all the questions today, but we will download the chat box and we will um, respond to you via email to answer your questions. Um, one last tip, you can make the speaker big by double clicking on their image and you know if you want to, while Olya is talking, if you'd like her screen to be the largest, just double click on her. Um, and then also you can just sit back and enjoy and just listen to other people's questions. So I want to take a moment to introduce Olya to you all. You might be familiar with her work already, but in case this is your first WC and ex Expo, um, Olya is typically based in Uzbekistan, but today she's calling in from Germany. And Olya is the Research and Development Officer for Saiga Conservation Alliance, which is a multinational coalition of conservationists and researcher, researchers dedicated to the survival of this critically endangered antelope throughout the Eurasian steppe ecosystem. Um, Saiga Conservation Alliance's community outreach, women engagement, women empowerment programs, and children's environmental education are critical to saving this species. Um, Olya began her involvement with Saiga Conservation Alliance, or you might hear us refer to it as SCA, um, as a volunteer, but she's been formerly part of their team since 2017. And I personally am thrilled to have her here with us today because her enthusiasm for Saiga um, is truly contagious. So I'm really excited that you guys get to ask her questions today. Um, I know that we have a lot of folks joining us today who are totally new to WCN in our work. So Olya, um, just to start us off, can you give us kind of a quick overview of what Saiga Conservation Alliance does and what you're doing to protect Saiga? And also if you wanna just say just an update as well of um, you know, how you guys are doing right now with this lockdown. Sure, um, so first of all, thanks so much for such a great introduction and thanks for, to everyone that you guys tuned in. Um, I think it's very timely that we all are having this conversation in even in these uneasy times. So to kind of introduce what I'm doing and what the Saiga Conservation Alliance is doing is um, basically everything are based around the Saiga antelope, which is a very weird looking uh, antelope, which is my personal best favorite. Um, they have a huge nose uh, and they are critically endangered because they are poached for their horns. Um, and I'm not alone here today. I actually have a friend with me in quarantine, uh, which is this guy. Uh, and this are exactly the Saigas, uh, the reason why we exist as Saiga Conservation Alliance. Um, so basically, we try to use different tools uh, and approaches to protect these critically endangered animals. And so um, those are the range of activities that uh, vary from conservation, uh, like applied conservation, grassroots stuff, uh, when we have uh, rangers in the field, for example, uh, watching out for the saigas and protecting them from poachers, or it can be more of a research uh, um, initiatives where we have scientists going into the field and um, counting the number of saigas, monitoring their activities. Uh, we also have educational and outreach activities uh, where we actually eng engage with the audience uh, and our communities. So um, if we try to sum it up, we try to tackle every bit of um, people that are in the ground when it comes to psychic conservation and their habitat. Uh, and also we try to engage uh, with wider audience uh, outside of Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Russia and Mongolia, which are the countries where Saiga is found currently these days. Um, so it goes beyond that uh, online, uh, like the events WCN, uh, for example, gives us a chance to participate in. Awesome. 
Yeah, and um, you also asked about a COVID situation and how things are being so far. So um, I think like for most of us, uh, things are very different these days. Um, it's it's also very interesting to, to see because in one way, things have not changed too much for us because we have international team of people um, that work from different locations. So this bit hasn't changed because we've been, you know, online quite a lot from before and we coordinate different projects from you know, behind the screen. But at the same time, uh, we have so many people working in the field, uh, working with the communities in schools, uh, all of the communities and big gatherings that are not permitted anymore. Um, so this, this has been very uh, destabilizing for all of us and for our community. So it's, um, it's very difficult times, I would say. Yeah, I'd imagine. Um, definitely an, an adjustment that has been difficult for all of us and I can't imagine being in the field right now. Um, so we are going to go ahead and dive into some questions. I'm going to let the first three people up on stage. So Janet, Natalie, and Carlin, I'm going to invite you guys up on screen. Oh, it looks like a couple. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to hop to Amy. Amy Wright. Oh, it looks like those were older. Oh, here we go. Hi, Amy. It's working. Hi, Amy. I I don't have I don't have a question. I was just listening. Oh, <laughs> oh awesome. Well, you can join us. I'll I'll bring up somebody else. You can see. And, and I don't have the full screen, and I don't know why. Oh. oh. Anyway, uh. I would. I just. I was just wanting to hear the update on how they're doing because I missed last year's conservation uh, expo. And anyway. Awesome. Well, we're so glad you can join us today. Yeah, thanks for joining and thanks for your question. So um, as far as the update concerned, um, I think, and previously there was a question about the massive die off that happened in Kazakhstan in 2015. And I think many people are curious to know what happened after. Uh, and basically we've seen some success uh, in the numbers of sagas. They're reproducing quite well. Uh, so right now, um, we've noticed that uh, there, is, there has been an increase of 40% in the population of Saigas since the die-off, so since the 2015 every year. So that's fantastic. And now we have over 300,000 Saigas uh, living in the wild, uh, which is the biggest number that we've seen um, in the near future or in the recent uh, past. So it's quite exciting for us. Uh, and we've got even some amazing images uh, of Saigas uh, crossing the borders, uh, images from camera traps and quite a good of team of uh, people that monitor the Saigas. So um, there has been some good things happening there. Good. Okay. All right. Thanks, Amy. We're going to say goodbye now and I'm going to invite somebody else up. And in the meantime, Olya, somebody chatted in a question to talk a little bit more about um, women's um, empowerment programs and how they work to preserve the Saiga. And I'm going to bring up Sarah and Libby in the meantime. Sure. So we've uh, we've done quite a number of uh, engagement with women, uh, trying to empower them because, um, as you probably heard from like other similar conservation programs, uh, quite often women don't have a, like a a right of a big say when it comes to decision making and uh, different participation in the community events. So it's something that's uh, been missing a little bit in Uzbekistan, for example, where we also have a strict hierarchy uh, when it comes to gender roles. Um, and so because of that, we really wanted to engage women more because they have a lot of potential and so many great creative ideas. Um, so basically what we did, um, we had a um, handicraft program uh, that was called Kuralai. Kuralai is a no local name for the Saiga baby um, from Uzbek language. And this program has been running for a few years where we would bring uh, women together so that they could not only work on producing these uh, handicrafts, uh, but also just meet each other and be part of the community. So in turns, these handicrafts were sold uh, so that the families of these women would get extra income that would allow them to buy uh, some other type of meat rather than the saiga meat. Uh, because uh, since the, in the villages there is a poaching going on, uh, quite often uh, people would kill saigas and saigas are poached for their horns nowadays, not for the meat. Um, but often when people try to 
uh, get the zygotes with horns, uh, they also accidentally kill the zygotes that also don't have horns. So only males have horns and females don't. Uh, and even if you kill the zygote with a horn, still there is a uh, the full body of the zygote that is basically left. And because people are very poor in the communities, they need um, they, they still use the meat just because it's there and it's available and it's free. So because of that, we wanted to give them extra income and um, enable them to, to make some other buying choices rather than the saga meat. Wow. So that's that's one of the examples. And then we also uh, had women who would work with kids, like primary school or kindergarten, that would also teach them different skills and participate in different events like the saga day. Wow, awesome. Um, it looks like it canceled the request to come on, to come on screen, feeling a little bit shy. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up some more questions from our um, chat box. Oh, we have Libby. Oh, hi. Oh. Hi, Libby. Hi. Libby. hi. Yeah, so that was actually, um, my question was the last question. So thank you, Olya, oh. so much um, for responding. But yeah, no, I do kind of have um, a follow-up question. So I read one study that showed um, how like unemployment and you were talking about like income um, can lead to like increases in poaching of Sega. Um, so yeah, do you have any programs that kind of provide like legitimate like employment opportunities um, to kind of try to um, like stave off some of the um, poaching? Right, so that's that's a very good question, and it's also our concern because indeed uh, poaching is correlated with uh, poverty, uh, because obviously when people don't have employment, they do something else that would bring them extra money. So, um, and right now we are starting a new project, a very large scale project actually that would at the end intend to create this kind of new job opportunities for the people so the project is focused um in the part like in central asia in the part where rlc is and the rlc is the forest it used to be the fourth greatest um body of water in the world but it shrinked because of the human impact because people use the water for agriculture and then right now it turned into a desert and it happened also very quickly in the matter of just few years um and it happened during this ussr times so and by the end of it so when when it was the, the most critical time maybe like the last like five or ten years it was happening that uh ussr broke down so there was no government whatsoever and there was no one it was such an uncertain situation so there was no one to take care of this ecological disaster and so basically uh people just continue to overuse the water resources uh for planting the cotton which is the the main crop in Uzbekistan, for example. Um, and that's how it happened that now the entire like huge waste region that once used to be seen now dried up and turned turned into a desert. Um, and in the middle of that RLC was an island, a very beautiful, interesting island uh, that was also inhabited by the Saigas. Um, and the interesting story about the story about this island that during the USSR times, the island was used as a military base. So once it was a pristine, very beautiful, unique island, but then it was also under the human impact. But that was a very interesting type of human impact because the area was uh, conserved very strictly. So it turned into a military base where they used to uh, taste chemical weapons. And so because of that, the area was strictly preserved and locals were not allowed to come in like nobody without this like special permission and so very ironically that played a very good role in this whole situation because uh, of such strict regime the island was very well preserved and so many unique uh, species of plants like flora and fauna were preserved again because of this regime and so for a number of years again it's very ironic but like for a number of years people were not uh, allowed to go in but then after the breakdown of Soviet Union, the area was like officially open, but people were still afraid to go there because they heard all those story about the contamination and different kind of disease like anthrax and um, things like that. So people were scared and they would not uh, dare to come there. And it's also very far away, it's hard to get there and such. So right now, uh, people are not scared anymore because officially in 2017, the area was uh, announced to be safe so now it's possible to travel and also the road was built to reach that island which is now a big big plain like a prairie um and so what happens now is we have a concern that uh that the routes opened up uh people would want to explore this area and there are already business like different uh industrial plants going on because that area is also rich in gas and oil um which is obviously not going to be very good for the wildlife 
And so that's that's to give some kind of background of the area where we work. And so this is something that we are very um, passionate about at the moment because we want to turn this area into a protected area. And especially having Saiga as a flagship species there that would serve as a great indicator to see how the wildlife can restore um, if we see the increasing numbers of Saigas, for example. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity around this area and it's something brand new that we started working on this year. And so potentially once this area will be turned into some kind of form of protected area, it can be uh, local communities that protect the lands unofficially, or it can be a state protected area, it can be UNESCO biosphere reserve. So very many options really, but the area needs to be protected. And so what, once it's in place, uh, we will be able to employ locals and engage them into development of that region, but the sustainable one. Um, and right now is actually a very interesting time because um, there are so many bad things that came with COVID, for example, like so many industries have stopped working, so many activities have been shut down uh, and there's so much uncertainty. But we can also look at it as an opportunity because uh, right now everything slowed down and we can suggest the government, for example, to use this as an opportunity for growth, but the sustainable growth and we can replace the existing um, models that are there that are very old and outdated in a place like Uzbekistan, especially uh, with something that is environmental friendly and that will ensure that there is no net loss. So that's basically what we are working on at the moment uh, this year, starting on and moving forward. So that's exactly we'll tackle all those uh, problems, providing uh, employment for locals and much, much more. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Thank you. Thanks for your question. I'm so glad you got a chance to share about the ALC. I love that story and just the story of recovery for Saiga and so many other species in that area. Um, Becca posted a link in the chat about more about that work. So if you guys want to check that out, um, I'm going to invite up Patty and Nicole next. Hopefully they're still around and can join us on screen. Looks like maybe not. We're going to try Julius and Juniper. Oh, there's Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Oh, hi, Kathy. Good to see you. See you guys. How's everything going in um, Pakistan? Like? <laughs> yeah, so uh, very, very different <laughs> from where it used to be, getting used to a new uh, style of living. Uh, Uzbekistan is uh, also in the lockdown, uh, so basically it's not permitted to go outside in the groups of more than two people. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone has to wear masks, it's mandatory, uh, all schools are shut down, all, uh, well, all stores apart from the necessity stores, so I think it's maybe very similar to what's going on in the States, except it's more, probably even more uh, strict. Um, have you had any more of the virus going through the uh the antelope this year like you did in 2015 no yeah. we did not oh, that's good that's that's wow. that's really good <laughs> awesome and, and then julius did you have a question for olia uh yes uh thanks very much for this um this uh was how how well supported was the um the findings that it was the uh, pastorella bacterium that uh caused the massive die-offs in 2015 and 16. Is that pretty well established now? Yes, it is pretty well established right now. And it was just like one case in 2015. Uh, there was another okay. die-off in 2017 in Mongolia, but for a different reason that has nothing to do with pastorella bacteria. Um, and we haven't seen the outbreak of the same disease uh, since after. So okay. fingers crossed, nothing has is going to yeah. change in this sense. Yeah. And right. that's something that, um, oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead, you can go ahead and finish. Go ahead. Sorry. Go <laughs> um, I was also curious, actually, about, uh, I had another quick question for you, um, if, if that's all right. Sure. Um, uh, I am uh, a scientific illustrator, um, and I do a lot of uh, work uh, donating my um, efforts to help with conservation causes. And I'm wondering if there is any way that uh, that artists can get involved to help with, for example, the um, the Sega conservation, if there's any avenues where you know one can be involved that way. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for what you're doing. It's very kind, and I think you've helped a lot of people already. That's fantastic, and thanks for your interest you. in Saiga conservation. So yes, absolutely, there are many different ways, and we are always um, welcoming uh, some kind of creative solutions. So if you if, if there's something that inspires you, we'll be only happy to support it. And I'm sure we can find a way how, oh. yeah, how we can work on something together. So maybe we can exchange contacts and. Awesome. Yep. 
Cool. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Yeah, whatever can help. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Julius. I love when people are inspired to use their talents to help wildlife. It's, it's amazing. Um, Julius's question made me or his offer to help as a as an artist made me want to bring up a question from our chat. Because the saiga has such an interesting nose, which I think oh, yeah. is like such a fun way if you're an artist, what better species to get to illustrate or um, draw. So can you talk us to, can you tell us more about the saiga nose and if there's any other species like that? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and bring up one other Susan um, onto our um, screen as you answer that question. Sure. So, mm, Saiga's nose is probably my favorite feature on the Saiga because it's so unique. Uh, and I don't think there is uh, another animal quite like Saiga in this sense, uh, if we talk about their noses. Um, and I think many people uh, automatically assume that their nose um, must mean that they can smell things very well, that, that they have very good sense of smell, but it's not quite true, even though it's very big and impressive. Uh, the primarily two reasons why they have such a big nose is that uh, one, that they uh, have to filter the air. This um, animals actually run very fast uh, with the speed of a car. So it should be something like 50 hours, uh, 50 miles per hour, which is very fast because uh, yeah. these guys have to run away from the predators. Um, and while they run, uh, bear in mind that they live in the desert. And so there's lots of dust uh, in the air, so they have to filter the air somehow, otherwise it will not be possible for them to keep the same speed. And so that's why they have such a big nose, but that's in summer. Uh, in winter, uh, it has a totally different uh, uh, like need. And in winter, we have a lot of snow in the deserts of Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, Russia and Mongolia. And in the winter time, they have to heat up the air because it drops like the temperature drops down to very extreme uh limits and it can be like minus up to 50 degrees celsius which is again super cold and not every uh, species can adapt to such extreme temperatures so because of that they have to heat up the air in the winter time so basically yeah those are two two main uh, awesome. needs. um i'm gonna take one more question from the chat um from eleanor um, she asked, does the fact that um, males are poached more, does that lead to an unbalanced structure of herds? And does that, how does that impact the saiga? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, because only males have horns and right now the primarily focus when it comes to poaching is the horns, uh, there is a big disbalance uh, and distortion in the proportions when it comes to uh, males versus females. Uh, so normally sagas would live in herds and uh, saga male would mate with few females. Uh, and normally the size, like the number of females would be something like 15 to 20. But now because we have uh, selective voting going on, targeting males, uh, there is big disproportion. And we've seen harems, like we call it harems, when there's one male mm -hmm. saga and then number of females. So we've seen harems uh, where there would be like one saga male and maybe like 40 or 50 females, which is not right because it also impacts the genetic variety of the herd. Uh, and ideally the number should be balanced. And um, there was an assumption that this is partly the reason why sagas are more susceptible to different kinds of diseases like the outbreaks that happened in 2015, etc. Uh, simply because uh, their immune system is not as resilient as they would have been if there was more genetic variety. Yeah. So. Definitely. Um, Nicole, do you have a question? Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Olga. Good to see you. you. It's awesome. Keep up the amazing work. You're so inspiring. And well, there's a couple things I'd like to know about a little more. And uh, as you know, I'm passionate about kids getting excited about uh, endangered species and animals. And I remember when I was in Uzbekistan with you and your mom and, and dad, uh, you had said, you know, when I was a kid, I really wasn't interested in conservation. And here you are doing incredible work as a conservationist. And for those of us who are parents, um, my 16 year old doesn't seem that interested, even though I've been lifelong passionate person around this. How would you say that you could inspire uh, kids to become passionate about endangered animals? It really uh, concerns me that many kids don't, aren't even aware of uh, most um, at wildlife. They're more aware of pets like dogs and cats and cows mm -hmm. than um, they are about beautiful animals like the saiga. And uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. 
Uh, thanks so much for the kind words and for the question, Nicole. I'm also very happy to see you. So basically, yes, uh, you're very correct because now it's really hard to get kids inspired uh, about the wildlife. I think part of the reason is that we are losing uh, direct connection uh, with the wildlife. Because um, if I compare the city kids, like myself, uh, to some of the kids that uh, we get to meet in some of the villages or the, the most beautiful remote areas um, in Uzbekistan when we travel for work, um it's it's totally different so i could see that kids from like more remote locations they have a better understanding of uh the wildlife and like stronger connection simply because they were exposed more to seeing uh those animals in their lifetimes in person and not on the tv and like not on the internet so it's something uh that is going to happen inevitably because we have less and less access to wildlife and maybe for the best when it comes to thinking what kind of impact we make on wildlife um, but what i've noticed as well you don't necessarily have to see the animal in the wild to develop a deep passion for this species um, it should just be something that um that has to measure uh for you personally so uh if there's like it's it just a matter how well you know your kid for example or like your like if you're a teacher how know you you know your school kids um so if, if you know their interests if you know their passions you can always uh find a way how to connect their interests to the wildlife mm -hmm. um and i think it's also a matter of repetition or like um awareness campaigns when you get to hear more and more because i think oftentimes uh, many kids just don't know that there are animals like i don't know like the saga for example somewhere out there uh and because of that they're not even like it doesn't come to their heads that you know, th there might be a way to connect their passions to the animal. They just don't think about this. Uh, but once you expose them uh, to this opportunity, then I'm sure uh, they they will feel some kind of connection. Uh, and also, it's it's fair to say that not everyone has to be a huge wildlife flower. Like, let's admit it. Let's face it. People have different interests, and that's okay. Um, but I think everyone can develop like basic appreciation and uh, interest. Uh, towards wildlife so awesome. just and doing what we are doing i guess so we, have, we do have to wrap it up um uh, so sorry nicole thank you so much for your question i love it because the kids are you know our future and we have to get them engaged so i think that's just i'm so glad you brought that up talk to you again <laughs> um so oh yeah before we say goodbye i just want to thank you it is always such a pleasure to talk to you and it's clear you are so passionate and so knowledgeable about saiga um before we go i just would love um i think we all need moments of hope right now could you just share with us why you're hopeful for the species and just any last words you want to say yes uh with pleasure so um quite a few things make me uh happy and hopeful for the future simply because if we take the situation now with the COVID, uh, so many things have changed and it impacted so many people. But mm -hmm. I can still see how rangers, for example, go out in the field and protect the animals uh, from poachers. And that's incredible. That's probably, you know, one of the biggest things that give me the hope, uh, simply because we are in quarantine. And I think I said it before, but like because we are in quarantine, it doesn't mean that the poaching stops. And there are mm -hmm. people out there that know about the risks of their jobs and about the uncertainty of the situation but they still go out there and continue doing what they're doing and uh, i think they set a great example for us and they show that we still you know now we can understand each other even better than before because we are all united uh and can see each other's problems very clearly because we're all in the same situation uh and it creates this deeper connection between us and clearer understanding which uh also uh, helps us to be a bigger community and a better community and it also concerns the wildlife so it's not only the connection between the people but i think we all can clearly more clearly see the connection between the people and the wildlife and i think having this knowledge and clear representation now uh it will be so much easier to make some kind of decisions and i think it's also uh, a time when we can just pause and look and reevaluate some of the values that we have in life and uh, the activities that we do and what our role and what our goals are. Mm -hmm. um, and right now it's probably the easiest as it's ever been to change some of the things just because uh, things are kind of stopped at the moment. Um, so I would encourage everyone to just take this moment and think about what 
what your values are and what you can bring to the community and by community i mean other people and by life because we are all in it together um so yes we we all uh, need to be inspired and we all need support and and we all can give support to each other so Awesome. I think well, we share the world for the better. <laughs> you definitely inspire me. So thank you so much for just taking the time for us today. Um, we're going to take a break for about 15 minutes. And then everyone, if you could join us back on the main stage, we will have a panel about COVID-19 with some experts about how um, wildlife is related to that. So thank you again for joining us. And bye, Oya. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Bye, bye. everyone. Thanks to everyone.